Sunday for yet another exciting session with a world changer. These programs are designed to bring the best in the world to empower you for your success. People that have made a difference in the area of sports, entertainment, politics, social media, in the area of just general knowledge, you know, through the experience. So I don't want you to miss it because we've assembled the best of the best. For the first time, you can interact with them and ask them questions, find out how they made it, be in the same Zoom chat with them and get to have a one-on-one -on -one experience. People that you may have seen on TV and thought you'll never be able to ask them a question directly. Well, this is your chance. Join us this Sunday at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. You know, and uh, it's, I'm really excited because we have someone that uh, really made a mark difference in our world. And again, you know, like the video said, the whole point of what we're doing here is to try to empower our young entrepreneurs and to get them to learn from the best of the best and to be able to gain practical knowledge and experience from people who've done it, you know, not just uh, people who, who theorize about it, but people who've been out there and have got the wounds to show for it. And so, you know, we're just excited to bring you all this uh, for free, you know. And um, and so today we've got Farai Gundan, and I'm just going to read a bit of a bio and background, and then we're going to kick off. Farai is a graduate of the Master's in Public Administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. Additionally, she holds a Master's of Business Administration. She's a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, a Dengote Fellow. Some of you don't know Dengote. He's uh, uh, the richest man in Africa, uh, so says Forbes. Uh, Edward S. Mason Fellow and serves on the Board of Advisors of, Advisors of the Harvard Africa Policy Journal. Uh, the African-born speaker and entrepreneur has had her work featured on CNN, leading U.S. publications, Essence, Forbes, and the Opera Winfrey Show. Farai has been listed as the number one Forbes writer on the top 10 writersforforbes.com. Additionally, she was responsible for compiling the popular Forbes list, 10 most powerful men in Africa and 20 youngest power women in Africa. As an African evangelist, Farai has received recognition for her work in taking vision of the African excellence globally. And in 2017, Farai was named one of the 100 most influential people of African descent, as proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 68237, inter an international decade for people of African descent. She is the recipient of the 2016 Special Recognition Award by Zimbabwe Achievers Award. 2015 Media Excellence Award by African Women Award, 2014 Emerging African Leaders Award by Temple University, Lady, uh, Lady Brile Magazine named Farai as one of 20 influential African women entrepreneurs in America to watch in 2015. Farai was named as one of uh, its two, 2013 top 20 best young entrepreneurs for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Farai together with me. Farai, you're welcome. Thank you and so much. A, I'm all so right. What a, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. What an appropriate time to be talking about Africa and America. I think there's a lot that's going on, not only in Africa, but in, in the USA as well. And the fact that you know you have been placed in the United States and have, have been making a difference in America. And I know that just what I've read is not even part of uh, what you're doing and what you've done, you know? And so um, we really celebrate you. We celebrate your achievements and, and all the things that you're doing, you know? And so I'm gonna get right into it, uh, Farai. So why don't you tell us a bit about Farai? We've already had quite a bit, but I just wanna know a bit about you know, how you grew up and, you know, how you got to, to where you are. Thank you so much for um, this um, opportunity to speak to 
um, your, your network, uh, Dr. Mandaza. It's always an honor to interact and engage with you. I think I've known you for several years um, and have been inspired by the work that you are doing uh, on the continent uh, and really not only uh, leading the way uh, on the uh, um, entrepreneurship side of things, but now um, really actively uh, ensuring that the uh, upcoming generation um, learns, um, uh, you know, what to do and not, and, and not what to do, but really um, uh, empowering uh, the youth of the continent, the entrepreneurs of the continent, because I truly believe that um, even though we have political freedom uh, on the continent, um, I think our mandate now is economic freedom and really economic freedom um, in our lifetime. And as an African girl child, I think really my story, even though I was born and raised in Bulawayo to a single parent who instilled in uh, my sister, my younger sister and I, my, my younger sister lives in Canada, she's Canadian, um, instilled in us um, the uh, power of education. And really, I think um, it, it's true when they say success leads stories. So when I reflect on my, sitting here as a Harvard graduate, Mason Fellow, young global leader with the World Economic Forum, having written for global uh, publications. And as I reflect back on my journey, I realize that truly success does leave uh, clues along the journey. And I think one of the biggest, um, I think, um, assets and, and clues in my life is having a mother who, an African mother who uh, realized that in order to empower her daughters uh, was to put them through, um, to provide with them, provide them um, with uh, quality education. And so I think that's really consistent in my journey um, in that I've, I've come from a background where uh, my mother uh, valued education and ensured that my sister and I would get the, uh, the appropriate education that was needed for us to get to where we are. And so that has been my theme. Um, I think it all crystallized when I appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show um, several years ago. And in talking to Oprah Winfrey on her show, we talked about uh, two things which are um, a, a very strong, a very near and dear to my heart, and are also very near and dear to Oprah Winfrey's heart, which is uh, uh, black and brown girls, African girls, uh, as well as education. And so on that platform, I was able to really speak to her audience. And at that time, she was, I think, averaging about 10 million viewers across the United States and across the world. So um, her platform was pretty significant and powerful. But to be able to really sit there as an example of what education can do as an African girl child, I think really solidified to, uh, to Oprah and to her audience that when you do invest in um, in African girls and African boys, um, this is what you can get. You can get, you know, uh, world leaders. You can get, um, uh, you know, transformative leadership, whether in business, whether in government, whether in uh, in the nonprofit space. And so I think for me, that's when I really got my aha moment. Uh, Oprah is known for her aha moments, and uh, you know, the funny thing is, I also got my aha moment appearing on her on both her, you know, her, her, uh, her show and on her website talking about uh, the importance of education. So even as I am uh, talking to um, your, uh, you know, the, the, the entrepreneurs, uh, education, whether it's formal or informal, has got to be a very critical component of your journey as it was mine. And so I've used classroom settings, I've used, um, you know, education from um, mentors like yourself, Dr. Mandazo, where I've learned so much um, and really having the privilege of watching you behind the scenes and how you, you analyze deals, um, understanding the numbers behind deals, um, how you move um, when opportunities uh, um, uh, uh, present themselves. Um, so I've also used that uh, as well as part of my educational um, arsenal in becoming the person that I, uh, that I am. So, um, and at the time that I thank appeared you, on the Oprah Winfrey so Show, go ahead. Thank you, I was saying thank you. For, you are for, 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 appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And at the time that I appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show, I just graduated with my master's um, in business administration. I had attended a historically black uh, university here in the United States of Florida A&M. And I was working as a management consultant of one of the big four accounting firms. And at that time, we're helping um, a big three company um, 
to uh, reorg and emerge out of bankruptcy. So there, so my experience with corporate America, um, so, I, so I got my first experience in corporate America and really understanding how big businesses really understand and how they, they, um, they think about products and um, bring them to market, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the time that this company was going through um, bankruptcy really also helped me understand, um, I think, um, uh, two key things uh, about a business, and that was operational. So we did a lot of the operational due diligence, ensuring, them, ensuring that the processes were uh, efficient and really course correcting um, the company, and then also accounting and financial. Um, so really understanding that uh, as we're course correcting from the operational perspective, that on the accounting side, they were compliant um, and, and, and they were bringing everything to, um, to book in a way that would enable them to uh, emerge out of um, bankruptcy. So, so that was an interesting uh, period in my time. I was uh, traveling throughout NAFTA, the NAFTA region, which is you know Canada, throughout the U.S. and and Mexico, in really you know helping uh, these um, uh, uh, companies um, reorg. But um, at that time, I really felt, um, Dr. Mandaza, that I was not fulfilling my own my own um, personal mandate. Uh, as an African, I wanted to have some impact on the continent. And I think uh, appearing on the Oprah Winfrey and, and that going viral at the time it went viral, I then got tapped by a few uh, producers, particularly in Hollywood. And so I started um, my journey into media, very, very informal. Um, and, you know, really thanks to Oprah Winfrey, who really kind of, you know, that appearance on a show gave me that push in, in really saying, you know what, I do have a voice. You know, you're articulate. Um, you understand the con uh, the continent, and so I think that started the uh, the journey for me from a media side. And really, for me, I think at the time, um, uh, magazines such as The Economist had, you know, been writing, um, you know, headline headline stories or cover stories. Uh, Africa, the hopeless continent. Uh, you know, anywhere you turn, Dr. Mandaza, the uh, the narrative on the continent was just very negative. But it was a narrative that we were not shaping. Uh, it was a narrative that we were we were not even um, we were not even uh, contributing to. It was some people that were writing about the continent, and and I was thinking to myself, but this is not the this is not the Africa that I know, um, and so I was just really getting very very frustrated in um, in in the Africa that was being reported that was not reflected that that was not reflective of the great men and women like yourself that I thought were under the radar that were never given the opportunity uh, to talk about the opportunities. And yes, I don't want to romanticize uh, Africa. There are deep, deep issues understood. But I also understood that there were men and women that were innovating around those challenges and really were providing solutions and really um, were sincere about um, the solutions, were sincere about really understanding um, some of those challenges and the opportunities and, and, and how to provide solutions. And so I think when you couple those, um, I really realized that like what Oprah Winfrey had done uh, for me, I needed to use um, media uh, as a way to um, shape and shift the way we were talking about the continent. And also it was at the same time that I met DJ Spool, who has since become a, a, a personal friend and a, and a business partner of mine. Uh, and you know, DJ Spool is one of the biggest voices in South Africa. And um, being able to speak to his uh, audience uh, across South Africa and across um, uh, Southern Africa, I was really able to now um, you know, develop my speaking skills, my writing skills, um, and really understand um, and then living in the US, really understand um, the minds of investors, the minds of um, um, uh, you know, uh, foreigners who are looking to uh, get in, uh, into, uh, into the continent. And, um, and then obviously, you know, the big call came from Forbes and they wanted you know, writers um, who understood the continent. And at the time we were now including billionaires, whether it's Aliko Dangote, whether it's Straf Masiwa, whether it's Patrice Motsepe of South Africa, Mo Dueji, Tanzania, Aforo Nchalakija, one of the three black women um, billionaires uh, in the continent. So they were looking for writers who not only understood the continent, but who could provide access to these individuals to provide a more nuanced look into um, their businesses. And I really took on the challenge, uh, Dr. Mandaza. I, I really wanted to be at the forefront of, I think, what was happening 
uh, with the continent. And that was this narrative of Africa rising um, and that there was um, um, a, a hunger and a thirst, particularly from the youth of the continent. You know, um, I, I think the youth is 60% of the uh, entire population of the continent, 1.2 billion uh, folks, 60% of that is, is a very young um, um, uh, population that's hungry, that, you know, but lacks opportunities. And so for me, I wanted to be that bridge that told the stories of how the Dangotas of this world um, um, became who they were. Uh, and it's really not according to Forbes. Earlier on, you said, uh, I'm a Dangote fellow, which I am, uh, and he's a billionaire according to Forbes. Really, that's his net worth. Um, you know, he is the richest black man in the no, world. I, I, didn't mean it in a, I didn't mean it in a bad way. I was no, trying I know to you emphasize that Dangote is a, is, a, is a confirmed billionaire by Forbes. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, yeah. yes, no, I completely understand. So, so for me, it was um, telling stories that would connect, um, you know, folks like your Dangote, so they're not abstract, they're not too far off. Uh, because I think when I was growing up and looking up to people like your Oprah Winfrey's and, and stuff, they were very, I mean, this, I'm mean, an African girl growing up in Africa, you know, Oprah is all the way across the, you know, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, completely unreachable. Uh, and the fact that I got to meet her, the fact that I got to hug her and, and chat with her, um, you know, is, is, is truly, truly mind blowing. And so for me, I wanted to ensure that the next generation, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch, that the stories about um, uh, inspiration would come from people around them. Um, people like you, uh, Dr. Walter Mandazas, it shouldn't be such a far off, far fetched idea to, to land on. Uh, um, a Forbes list. And hence we came up with the uh, 20 most powerful uh, African women and 10 most powerful African, African men on Forbes list. And that was very controversial. Um, I remember the one list that we created, uh, Dr. Mandaza, and I'm going to then switch over to you for the next question, uh, was um, our, I think our third edition of the 10 most powerful African men. And on that list, I had put George Ware, the soccer player um, from uh, Liberia. That was so controversial. Do you know the people from Liberia came hard after me via my, uh, my, my editor that I reported to? They wanted that list taken down. And as a matter of fact, Forbes did take that list down and it was a big deal, right? Uh, people holding you accountable. Why is, George, uh, why is George Ware on that list, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, three years, uh, three years after that list went, um, was published, George Ware would become the president of, uh, of Liberia. So sometimes um, our stories are not with what they are at that point in time um, that, you know, you've got to realize that Africa is a developing story and it has to be nurtured and, and, and you've got to really understand the story of Africa, that it's, it's truly dynamic, as is the, the current conditions that you're seeing here in America. Um, and that you'd need folks that would um, really understand how to report in such a way that um, is not only... Um, provides current perspective, but also has a future uh, understanding of that is we're very dynamic, we're a change in people. And then we truly, at the end of the day, we want the best for the continent. So that's really, truly who Farai is in a nutshell, um, really using um, media to not only sell, sell the idea and the story of Africa to the world, but also ensuring that our stories inspire us and change the way we view ourselves. Because it's one thing for me to sell Africa to the rest of the world, if you yourself as an African do not think of yourself high enough to be sitting in the same rooms, whether it's at Davos with the World Economic Forum, or it's the G7 summit, or it's, um, it's you know, the various summits where, you know, global agendas are made, if you yourself don't think you qualify. Um, so, you know, that's, it's a two, it's a, it's a two pronged approach to the work that I do, especially on the media side. Right, right. Wow. That's that's so profound for I and uh, you know we really celebrate you and and what you've done and and building the bridges and bringing awareness on Africa that we do have successes in Africa and that Africa is not just a dark continent you know that there are things going on and there are people that are busy working and doing things and and just highlighting that you know it, it's it's so important because oftentimes in news is not told uh, correctly about Africa, you know? So <clears throat> we have to uh, change the mindset, you know? And so the, the space that you occupy is pro profoundly, profoundly important. And we just celebrate all your achievements, you know? I, I don't know how you've done it, 
at such a, a young age. I'm, I don't know how old you are, but you've achieved so much in such a short space of time. So we really want to appreciate you for that. And, you know, just getting to know about how, how you grew up, I think what's important for our entrepreneurs to understand is that success is, is just ordinary people, you know, that made a decision and took, took steps and, and started moving forward. And they, they found themselves in places where uh, they were being celebrated. And I think that's why we asked that question about, you know, your background, because, you know, we want to know, were you born in the royal family or, you know, did you actually come from a normal background? And you came from a normal background, born in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and yet here you are talking to billionaires in, in, in America and, and in Africa and, and bridging the gap. So we celebrate that. So I think we learned there that nothing is impossible. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from or the color of your skin, you can achieve a success if you, if you set your mind to it. So that, that's so amazing. And also you highlighted the power of education, you know, and, and knowledge is one of those things that, that one can never emphasize. And that's, that's why we do, we provide this kind of platforms because knowledge is empowering. The kind of stuff that you're sharing with us here today, some people pay tens of thousands of, of, of dollars just to hear this kind of information. And so, you know, we really want to thank you for those, for those uh, words uh, for right now. My next question is, I mean, you've been awarded all these awards, uh, you know, Young Entrepreneur Award, uh, top 100 uh, person, uh, people in, in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, my question is, what's the value in, in according to you of, uh, okay, education, as you say, and also understanding the world around us? And um, what's been your experience of that? Um, so I think the, you, so, and I'm always grateful when um, I'm acknowledged for the work that I've done, even though I, I, I think that, um, you know, I have colleagues who are, are doing much more and I think I, I take more of a hardline approach to myself in that I, I need to do much more, I need to do much more. And I think that's how I push myself further. But I, I think um, being named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum for me was pretty significant in that I think um, as the only one at the, the year that I was named a young global leader, I was the only one representing Zimbabwe. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a significant you know, acknowledgement. Um, you know, when you understand the process of the World Economic Forum and when you know who the World Economic Forum is, you realize that it's, it's quite um, a weight to it. So, the significance of that and how it has helped, I think, expand my understanding of the world is that I think through the World Economic Forum, been able to get into rooms uh, with world leaders, whether it's at Davos, whether it's in China, whether it's even in Africa when they've hosted the, uh, the World Economic Forum Africa meetings and just being in rooms either with presidents, uh, industry captains, um, and uh, civic leaders and really understanding some of the challenges, whether it's a regional um, uh, issue that we're facing to uh, global uh, issues that we're facing and really understanding how are these leaders thinking about um, these challenges what are the solution what are the proposed solutions and then for me most importantly is what is Africa's contribution towards those challenges because climate uh, uh, you know the, the issue of, of climate change right is not just a Western um, um, uh, uh, issue it's a global oh, issue. Yeah. Um, when I spent time, yeah, when I spent time in Harvard with the president of uh, Mauritius, you know, we discover that Mauritius as an island, uh, as an African island uh, country, is really affected by this, right? And so, and how are they innov innovating around the challenge of climate change? And then how do you bring their solutions to, uh, to, uh, to Davos? And really begin to say, okay, these are the solutions, right? That the world can now maybe incorporate in their own uh, in their own regions or, or, or countries. Um, I'm quite inspired by uh, this um, uh, Madagascar a solution uh, towards COVID um, that's been floating around. And in my um, various networks, um, the issue has been because it's coming from Africa, therefore it's not valid. Because it's coming from Africa therefore uh, we're not going to take it seriously but if the same um remedy was coming from other regions um it would be taken up more more serious more seriously right so having those kind of conversations and ensuring that 
listen, we also have uh, solutions. Um, last year, as you know, um, through, uh, so, you know, after working in media um, and after um, my time at Harvard and graduating with my um, master's degree from Harvard, launched uh, Ivy Yard. Um, and Ivy Yard is a communications and um, strategy uh, firm, really helping um, either African governments, um, high net worth individuals, and companies um, in thinking through um, their comms, uh, whether it's across the region or uh, across the, uh, around the world. And um, we were hired last year by a technology company, uh, Flutterwave. Uh, it's Silicon Valley based. Uh, the Africa headquarters are in, um, in Lagos, Nigeria. And they wanted um, market entry into South Africa. And so we helped them think through uh, what market entry looks like for a, a tech startup that's African owned. Um, what I liked about the, 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 the Flutterwave story was that it was a, 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 a solution that was, uh, that came, that was um, developed by Africans for Africa. And as we're looking at the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that has been, um, that has been signed and is now rolling out, um, we've got to think about the infrastructure. So this is for the, for, for the, uh, for the um, entrepreneurs in, in, you know, that are listening in. As these agreements are happening and say, we're now, making, we're now making Africa as one trading block, very similar to what the EU has done. But those agreements, those trade agreements are upheld by your infrastructure. So your infrastructure can look like your road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, or even oceanic infrastructure, right? Um, you also have your infrastructure from a, a, a payment, uh, payment aspect. And this is where Flutterwave came in, in that they were solving the payment issue, in that you are there in South Africa, you have a product, you have a service, but your customer is in Kenya, your customer is in, uh, in Somalia. Who will, do, who will do that payment? And that's a question that I leave with you guys, right? Is who will, who will enable that payment? Who will enable what? PayPal doesn't operate across all African countries, um, as does Stripe as does uh, a lot of these payment gateways that are available to me here in America. But for you, the entrepreneur in South Africa, how will you enable a transaction to take place if your customer is in another country? And that was the power of Flutterwave. These Nigerian entrepreneurs who thought, gosh, there is no payment gateway that allows cross-border, that is border agnostic, that is currency agnostic, that is, um, that is platform agnostic, let us come up with a payment gateway that solves the Africa problem as we are making Africa a, a, a single trading block. And so we're able to help them um, um, uh, uh, you know, roll out across, uh, across uh, South Africa, taking them from Johannesburg, Pretoria, Durban, Cape Town, and then really across uh, uh, um, uh, South Africa and really evangelizing that, listen, as the economy is open, as the market, and when I say the market, I'm not just talking about South Africa, but I'm talking about the entire region under this, um, this, um, this trade agreement. And I really encourage all of you to go look it up and then think about your business and say, how does my business, can my business scale up and how can it scale given these plans that are happening from a regional perspective? And how can I take advantage of that? And so for Flutterwave, it was a payment technology. Um, that um, they came up with. So I think um, I, I think uh, recognition such as the young global leaders, young young global leader, for instance, Mason Fellow, um, which is a Harvard uh, uh, fellowship program, really puts me in the room in really understanding that okay, so these are some of the op these, these are some of the ways other regions are, are solving um challenges in their own regions and this is what africa can do for its own market 1.2 billion people is a significant market the us i think uh, and i think mr rich can can correct me i think it's 350 million um the black spend in america for example is 1.2 trillion dollars so there's a significant buying power just from the black spend so entrepreneurs think about the Africa spend, you've got to do your research. And when I've spoken in Africa, I've always said to you guys, I've always said to the entrepreneurs, as you're building your business, understand the, um, the indicators that will drive your business. So really understand like, what is the spend? What is the African spend? What is the middle class? What, what number is that? What is the middle class in South Africa? You know, and what spend is that in rands? And then as you're thinking of scaling, 
SADC region, how, how, what is the population of the SADC region? What, 300 million people, 350 million people? That's equivalent to the American um, uh, um, uh, uh, population. Um, really look, incorporating those numbers, understanding where you're operating just beyond how dang, just beyond, uh, uh, just beyond how dang, just beyond Johannesburg, right? And so for me, having been named a young global leader, being a Mason fellow, it expanded my thinking, Dr. Mandaza beyond my Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is 50 million people. What can I do with 50 million people? To, end, to, to, be, to give you perspective, to be on the Forbes list, you've got to be solving a big, big number, right? You've got to be solving a big, big problem, rather, a big, big problem. Um, Dangote is fortunate in that uh, the, Nigerian, the Nigerian market is 180 million people, right? So he, significant, he, he, he was solving a significant uh, problem. Uh, Madame Alakija, who's an oil mogul, um, really was able to tap into a product that the world needs beyond Nigeria, right? Um, when you think about Strife Masiwa and how he started in Zimbabwe, um, but for him, he quickly realized that, yes, I got Zimbabwe on lockdown, but it really to scale to, uh, to the billion um, level, I've got to go beyond Zimbabwe and get into your Botswanas and get into your other markets uh, in order for uh, the Econet brand to, um, to, to, to really scale, to really scale. Mo Dueji in Tanzania, when I went, when he flew me out to Dar es Salaam and I spent a week uh, or two uh, understanding his operations, he said uh, he operates across 11 East African countries. Uh, he provides textiles, he provides uh, bottled water, he provides or an array of services across 11 African countries. That's why Mo is the youngest billionaire on the Forbes uh, list of billionaires in Africa. Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's very profound. And, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's so important just to understand a lot of the, the things that you're talking about and how our African entrepreneurs need to develop a different mindset. And I think that's, that's what it's all about. It boils down on how you see the world. You know, I always say that there is no company that cannot be bitten on the planet. You know, I literally say if you if you can, if you don't know what sector to get into, go and open a telephone book and go put your finger anywhere. And whatever company that you put your finger on, you can beat that company and do better, provide better service, better uh, uh, efficient uh, delivery, better price, and a better product. You know, and we've seen that throughout, uh, uh, you know, the decades and with companies that have come and gone and younger people with that, that think at a different level and see the world differently and that have come in and done exactly the same thing, but better, more efficient. And so I think what you're talking about is that the world is evolving and the leaders that are going to need to emerge in this new economy, in this new decade, are leaders that can think outside the box. Those are the guys that are going to survive because I think the world is not going to be ruled anymore by uh, politics or military power or, or, or anything else. So the, the thinkers are the guys that are going to win. Uh, in this in this new world order, so and and we really you know appreciate all all of that. And I mean how how you crossing the bridge, um, you know. And so I think that leads to my next question. I think you know you 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 interacting with uh, a lot of these people, and um, you know you've been featured on on all these platforms and that are huge mega plat platforms. You know, uh, I just you know, want to find out from you. I mean, you know, we have young entrepreneurs here that are aspiring for that world that you currently are in, you know. Uh, because of your work, you probably meet more rich, successful billionaires than anybody else. Uh, what can a young entrepreneur aspiring for that world and that kind of, or that career, maybe a career in media or journalism and, you know, you know what, what would you say to them? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good question, um, right? Um, so I think um, the silver lining to COVID is that COVID has really um, been disruptive uh, in so many ways. And I think you and I privately have spoken about this, Dr. Mandaza, in saying that, you know, yes, obviously it's, it's, it's very humbling. It's a very sobering time that we find ourselves in. It's an invisible uh, enemy that affects any one of us, regardless of race, gender, whatever, right? 
uh, COVID has been quite disruptive. My mother is a frontline worker. She's in the medical field here in the U.S., um, working uh, 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 in American health facilities in, 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 in dealing with this, this, this disease. And so I see it up front. I have infectious um, disease doctors, uh, nurses in the field who are dealing with, uh, with COVID. So COVID has been very, very disruptive. And to see it up close and personal, I think for me, it's been very humbling. Um, I am truly grateful to God that I'm even alive, have not contracted it, given the proximity that I have to um, some of these folks. I'm, I'm grounded in Michigan, and I am uh, quarantining with my mom just to be of support to her, uh, because COVID does take a toll, and it does take a, a toll on um, the frontline workers, um, the, the exhaustion, the, the, the fact that yeah. you know, colleagues can, can be affected um, by, by COVID and therefore um, they have to step in, sometimes working double shifts, sometimes working really long hours uh, mm -hmm. in order to, um, to cover any shortfalls in, uh, in, 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 in medical personnel. Um, so, so that's the, the, the sobering, the, the hard side, the, uh, the, the, the messages that, you know, either someone is in hospital, our general contractor for our property, uh, who works on our properties um, here in the U.S., actually had COVID. I met with him for the first time on Friday, uh, going through uh, the work that's needed as the state is opening up and now people are getting back to work. So we were going through our scope of work and what needs to be done because we own rental properties. And so um, he's back to work, but it was um, a very close call for him. So that's the reality of it. And, and I wanna make sure that I stress that. Um, and, and, and it's against this backdrop that I say though, there is a silver lining um, to COVID and that is really disruptive uh, on so many levels. In that when you're seeing companies such as Hertz uh, filing for bankruptcy, and that's a rental car. And I think the uh, Hertz is in South Africa. I may have seen them at the airport when I've come to South Africa. When you have companies such as um, your JC Pennies, your Pier One, um, these are your big, um, big box retailers uh, in the U.S. filing for bankruptcy um, due to COVID and and how disruptive it has been in the operations. And me coming with my MBA and really understanding um, business operations. I realize that there is silver lining. There is an opportunity for the new generation to step in and say, how can we innovate? I'm seeing a lot of uh, activity uh, with the younger folks say, what are some of the services, whether they are actually goods or whether they're services and how can we bring them online? And then how can we, and, and then how can we be fast to market, provide the best service and the best rates? Um, for the same services that have been traditionally um, uh, offered. So I think for the, for, for, for the entrepreneurs, it's really saying, it's really, it's, it's really, it's that. It's looking at the world around you and saying, what can, what can I offer and what can really go online? I, I'm really seeing a lot of it now with COVID just completely collapsing the borders, if you will, uh, collapsing um, how we do business. When you look at education, you and I have spoken about that, you know, education where, that model is being disruptive. Um, even at Harvard, I, I shared with you, um, you, you know, some um, some uh, co correspondence from Harvard, where they're really thinking, they're thinking about what does the model look like um, coming fall. So, using the summer to really think about how do we how do we enhance or how do we ch uh, uh, establish our operations given. Um, uh, you, you know, given a COVID, the nature of COVID, uh, because it, it definitely we will have other forms of uh, COVIDs. So how do we then shape our, our, our business operations, our businesses to ensure that we're not affected as we've been affected now? Because a lot of us were caught, were, were caught with our pants uh, down. Um, I had a client in South Africa, we're preparing to come to South Africa. We had to cancel and we had to move everything online. And then I had to even sh uh, shape uh, and change the way we do our business. So that was on the media side. On the manufacturing side, for those of you that are in the um, in uh, in manufacturing in, in in the manufacture of goods, it's really thinking about how do you plug into the global supply chain. Um, we, you know, we've seen America um, really get into this trade war with China, and I mean it's something that President Trump has been engaged in um, since last year, and you know. It is an area where I, 
I, I see where he's coming from. I've, I've, I've understood where he's coming from in that when you place a reliance on any one particular uh, country and then a COVID happens, then what happens, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's ha having those conversations with entrepreneurs or uh, in saying, how do you, how do you plug in? What can you offer? Um, in terms of uh, goods. Uh, DJ Spoo and I are certainly having those conversations uh, regarding the manufacturer. As you know, he has the energy drink more fire. So he has some experience in manufacturing. So we're thinking about other products that we can bring to, um, we can bring to market. And not only just South Africa, but just really the world, um, right? Um, I, I also push for ownership. And I push for ownership, particularly for black and brown folks we've got to own stuff folks mm -hmm. you've got to really think about ownership uh it's a it's a very sensitive topic i understand but it's a necessary conversation that we have to have that we've got to think beyond the now and really think a hundred years from now i mean jay-z the rapper jay-z talks about um 100 year um uh type of wealth you know, it's really structuring and you start small. I, I mean, and, and this is the journey that for me started about two years ago, really having to say, you know what? Yeah, we can, we can, I, you know, I'm, I'm traveling to South Africa, at least I'm traveling to the continent at least once a month from the US. But what, what but do I have assets that work, that can work in my absence? So really thinking about assets, really understanding about passive versus active income right and then that's when you really understand uh, 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 ownership where even if i don't even regardless of where i am mm -hmm. our real estate properties are always going to produce income right when you have like a swoo who has the more fire right more fire energy drinks is going to be sold whether he's in south africa or in the us how are you setting yourself up and thinking a hundred years from now. I think that's an area that we haven't been talking about in real, in real ways. And what does it mean? And how do you set yourself up? And I'm really happy that someone like a Jeff Rich is, 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 is part of, is, 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 is here because this is where we learn from people like him who, you know, you know, the, you know, as, as an African person, um, and going to Harvard and, and sitting in, in rooms where, you know, you have the extremely rich to, you know, people from different backgrounds is really having the humility to say, there is so much I can learn from like a, a, a Jeff Rich. He doesn't look like me. He's male. He's white American. And he comes from a different background. But the humility in my part as an African, as an African woman who's educated says, there's so much I can learn from this gentleman because they obviously they obviously see things differently and can help you think differently um because when i look at the state of africa really truly it's a it's a it's a it's an audit on our leadership and it's really an indictment on our own actions and that we haven't done what is necessary to engage with people that do not look like us and say listen what can i learn from you how can i how should I be thinking about the continent? Because I, 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 honestly, if you were to ask Jeff Rich, look at Africa, I'll be curious to know how he's thinking about the continent and how he can innovate, what would be the solutions? And I think it's having those conversations and those are not, they may not be comfortable conversations. They'd be very uncomfortable in that they will challenge you. They will, they will anger you, which is what's happening in America, right? So when we talk about the race uh, issue in America, it's a very uncomfortable conversation, but it needs to be had, right? It, 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 it doesn't mean, it, 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 it needs to be had. It just needs to be had. And as Africans, with our, uh, with our responsibility to lead the 1.2 billion uh, people, we also have to reach across um uh the aisle if you will to folks like you know your jeff rich who have been able to succeed and say help us in really thinking and 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 um in really thinking about how we are thinking uh about solving um the the issue of of the continent yeah. i'm hoping i'm making sense with that i i've been i've, no, I've been spending absolutely. time thinking about this 
No, I know, I, I know, and you very, and I know how passionate you are about about the subject on developing Africa in particular, and and I think your question is clear. And Jeff has been on on our, our, our shows, I think, twice now. I don't know, Jeff, if if you have something to say. I know you're not meant to be saying anything, but you're free to respond. You know, if you want to, uh, just a few minutes, and then after that, I'm gonna open it up for questions. You know. Yeah. No, I, I think Fry, you have a you have a an amazing point, which is so simple and so beautiful in its elegance, and that is ownership matters in investing in businesses with a hundred year perspective. I learned at a very young age that the people that owned businesses did very well. And the people that owned businesses made an impact on society, much more so than politicians. Yeah, much more so than politicians. Business leaders make a difference. People that are investing in roads and infrastructure and networks and, you know, in food sources and in clean water. Those are important and essential ingredients that you need for a society. You know, before we can go to movie theaters, we need to feel we need to feel safe. We need to have the basics that human beings need to survive and and investing in things that people need are so critical. So I, I applaud you. It's all about ownership, and, yeah, and don't be yeah. don't be too concerned with current income. Be concerned with the hundred years. Right, right. That's fantastic, and and that's that's one thing that I'm also passionate about. It's about building things that last, and I think that's really what what we're saying here is when you start your business, don't just think about making your money so that you can buy a BMW and buy a nice house and feed your family. That should not be your motivation. Think about how your business can affect other people's lives. Think about how your business can last for a hundred years. You know, you know, if you weren't thinking those thoughts in your business, begin to think them because that's how you begin to build systems and processes that can carry beyond your being there in the business. And when you, when, a, when your business gets to a point where you everything doesn't center on you, uh, then you know you you built a, a, a solid business. So that's fantastic, and that's what we build. We're trying to build in in our entrepreneurs that they must think ahead and and think far. And yeah. you know, there's something that that you said for I, and it's so interesting because I think you know a question has been asked on this platform every time we've had this this session. People are asking, okay, what business should I get yeah. into? You know, this COVID has affected, yeah. and you know, what should I be looking at? And I, I want to say this. I want to say that the entrepreneurs really need to understand, okay, first that the world has changed, okay, and we're not going back to where we were. So the world has changed, uh, and I think even if you remove COVID today, let's assume yeah. today COVID goes away. Tomorrow we are told there's no more COVID. Everybody's fine. Irregardless of that, the world still has changed. The way people think has changed. The way people are going to do business has changed. Income, uh, 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 you know, uh, disparities have changed, and and a lot has changed. So it's not going to go back to what we used to. So what we really should be looking at is saying, okay, if most of the businesses are going online, okay, you've got your Ed Cons going out of business. You've got your JC Penney's going out of business. All these businesses that were consuming a lot of money with all these huge buildings and, and all of this and Overhead, the malls. Yeah. And if, they, yeah. if they're closing down, which are the businesses that are coming up? Okay. And which are the businesses that are coming up that are linked uh, to that particular sector? You know, so if you've got your online shopping, for, for example, you've got payment gateways that, like Farai was saying, that, that, that need to be put in place to make it easier for people to pay. I mean, just beginning of this year, I, I had I went to the bank and I was trying to move money. I had ministered in a church in uh, in Kenya and I was trying to donate some money to them. And I actually transferred the money and it came back a, a couple of days. And then they sent me long emails about a hundred things that I needed to do for the reserve bank and blah, blah, blah. And I got tired. I said, listen, I'm not doing it, you know? Yeah. And I ended up sending a much smaller amount via, I think it was a Western Union or something like right. that, you know? So there's a gap there already. Yeah. Somebody needs to be able to help with that sort of thing. 
transportation, okay? There's somebody that's gonna need to package that stuff, packaging, package it, transport it, so it can be shipped off to wherever. So you buy it online, it must be moved to the port or wherever. So there's a, a, a business right there, branding, you know, you've got software development, you've got the fuel sector, because you need to, so begin to think about the things that are connected to the way the world is going, because that's where the need is, and begin to see how you can begin to tap into those things, okay? Yeah. So, you know, like medical supplies, for instance, is a huge uh, problem with, with medical issues right now from every angle, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, I think, is really the answer to, to uh, some and, of those questions. And, and, and even thinking about that, I mean, you, you think about um, the nature of COVID and especially when they're doing contact tracing and Africa really having leapfrogged in, tele in, the, in, in the telecoms uh, industry um, and thinking about um, how do you come up with a solution? You know, um, Africa had Ebola and I was talking to um, my dear brother, Dikembe Mutombo, who's, a, who's, a, who's an NBA, who's a former NBA player and who's, who, who I'm really close to here in the U.S., and I was just talking to him about uh, Ebola having come, is coming back to, um, to the DRC. But what are some of those lessons learned from uh, our time with Ebola? You know, um, I talk about the fact that, you know, when you travel to Africa, um, you have the uh, thermometers that do the body, the, the, the temperature scan, right? So Africa is, is, is a few, you know, it's quite ahead uh, in that space when it comes to um, capturing or, ca or catching any of those uh, diseases where you know you can tell from a from a body scan in america they don't have that we, you know you come to any airport um i you know i have american friends who are coming from south africa who are coming from other parts of the world uh being evacuated because of covid and there was no testing uh, at the airports so those are some of the areas where as 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 um as entrepreneurs uh you can really be thinking about can i come up with an with an app that enables mobi mobile health that can help with contact tracing, that can help with, um, uh, you know, I have virtual video, uh, 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 video um, appointments with my doctor, uh, as does my mother, because of the nature of COVID. Who is enabling that technology? Yes, we, right now we're using Zoom, but on the medical side where there's a, a bit of, bit more, there's a little bit more encryption that's needed, there's a little bit more um, a privacy uh, that you need to um, have encoded to ensure that that, con that that data or whether that video or whatever service, who is providing that service? This is really where you would step in and say, what type of technology is needed to, um, to, um, to, um, to, uh, to enable, uh, to enable, you know, the, the way we're now doing business. Um, I, I tell the story, uh, Dr. Mandaza, um, uh, so Mo Dueji is, is, he's Indian, he's from Tanzania. And he's, you know, he's, he's, he's known as Africa's youngest billionaire. And so whenever I see uh, Mo, especially when we're doing, uh, w you know, these um, World Economic Forum meetings and you have all these guys that have flown into the private jets, I always tease Mo. And I always say, but Mo, how come of all the billionaires that are here, you're the only one who flew commercial? Like, dude, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, why, why, why are you, you know, why are you doing this to the billionaire world? And Mo's always said to me, Farai, I'm not an oil person. I don't produce oil. Um, I have to sell um, just a bottle. And so he'll take a bottle of water and say, I just have to sell a billion of these because they typically go for a dollar. He's like, I have to sell a billion of these in order to make a billion dollars or I have to sell like more than a billion dollars, right? And so that has really, that has, that has always stayed on me, um, right? In terms of, even as 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 you're thinking about your business, as you're thinking about the product, and um, and I couple that story with a, a class I took at the business school, at the Harvard Business School, and that was uh, business at the base of the pyramid. In a lot of African countries, a lot of emerging economies are you know base of the pyramid economies, where you have to make products that are a dollar or less, um, and then your your challenge now is. How do I mass market this? How do I get this product to as many people as possible? Well, because of COVID, you now have the opportunity. Because as you're in lockdown, what are people doing? People are on their mobile. People are, 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 on, are online somehow doing something. 
So now you have a, an opportunity to go beyond the, you know, I think South Africa is what, 65 million people, 80 million people, to go yeah. beyond the uh, South African population and really target the rest of the world because of what COVID has done. And even if it's selling, uh, selling just one product at a dollar, think about it. Mo did it before COVID and landed on the Forbes list of billion, uh, Forbes list of billionaires, right? What about you guys now that you have a COVID that has forced people to be at home, to be on their mobile, to actually buy stuff um, from, uh, from online? So you have a take a lot, but where the other African owned take a lots out there that can yeah. be, uh, can be, can be, can be, um, can be developed. So yeah. those are some, so, so those are some of the, uh, I think the, the, the interactions, Dr. Mandaza, that have really, even personally as an entrepreneur, have really challenged me. Um, talking about a transaction, I just transacted for um, a PPE products, uh, sent some money, a uh, significant amount of money to, uh, to Singapore. Very seamless, very, very seamless. And part of the reason was the partner in South Africa couldn't send the money to Singapore. So it was easier for me here in America to send the money to Singapore in order for this transaction to take place. So it, it had me thinking, well, if, if, if it's just him, what about the other um, uh, yeah. entrepreneurs? I had a, an order for um, paper products with a city here in the US. Um, the, the manufacturer in South Africa had two problems. One, it was a transaction problem, payment problem. And then two, to move the products from his uh, manufacturing plant in Johannesburg to Cape Town was going to cost more than moving the product from Cape Town to a port here in the US. Mm -hmm. So to your point, who's solving the logistics problem? So then we lower the prices of moving goods around the continent of Africa. Right, right. Fantastic. And I, I think we're going to have a mantra here on these sessions where we say, you guys go and look for problems, <laughs> you know, because, you know, that's really what it's about. Look for problems, right? And solve them. Uh, how hard can it get, you know? And, and, and anybody who's a problem solver will always make it. You know, if, if you can solve my problem, I tell you what, I'm going to pay attention to you. The problem is, I think Jeff Rich also mentioned this last week, is people want to sell what they like. They don't, they don't think about what the customer wants and what his problem is. And it's, I like this and I think this is great. So we, it's, it's kind of a mindset shift that we need to have. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask just two questions. There's people that uh, are sending their questions already. And they're also just thanking you. Zandi says, what a powerful input. Very progressive and thought-provoking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zandi. And uh, then we've got Tenji who says, what a powerful discourse. Thanks, Farai, for tackling the uncomfortable topics. Love you. All right, then I've got a question here. I'm watching with my two daughters who love Farai. I'd like to know if she feels any pressure to overachieve as a woman in a male-dominated media industry. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and, and really hello to the young girls who are watching as well. Uh, I'm also very mindful of um, the upcoming generation um, that um, especially, uh, you know, black and brown girls and black and brown boys. So I'm very, very uh, mindful even in how I move. And so I think when you realize that, um, you know, too much is given, much is required, you kind of change um, how you, 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 you move in this world. And I always say to folks, you know, move wisely in the world. Um, so my social media uh, footprint, you'll see it, you know, it's not scandalous. I'm very, very mindful because I know that there's eyes watching and that we've got to set a model for these young girls. So I really appreciate you, uh, Sister uh, Tenji, for having your girls um, even participate in, 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 in these conversations. Um, even though we think they're young, they're still really, children are really, um, they, they really have an understanding even beyond, you know, uh, us adults. Um, so to the question, do I feel pressure? Absolutely. I feel pressure as a woman. I feel pressure as a black person in America. I feel pressure as an African person. Um, and, and therefore I, I'm always over, over performing. I'm, I'm, I'm always hard on myself. Um, part of the reason why I even went to Harvard, because I wanted to get into rooms and I, I wanted, I didn't want there to be a question of my ability you know um my, my concern especially with this generation that's coming up especially the, the, the young girls and especially as you look at 
you know, the, 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 the pop culture here in the, in the U.S., um, you, you see that they trade on looks. Now I'm talking about, you know, black women and, and, and black celebs and, and, and all of this. They trade on looks. And we cannot do that. That's not a message that I want to send to young girls, that you cannot trade on looks. And my heart breaks at, you know, what I see, especially on my, um, you know, black uh, female, you know, you know, whether it's Cardi B and she's very, very talented. Uh, and these are people with huge platforms. But again, we cannot trade on the external. You know, we've got to make sure that we balance that out with, you've got to be educated. You've got to ensure yeah. that you are, you know, um, uh, empowering yourself. And so for me, it's taking a year, a year, a year, two years out and getting myself educated. Um, it's, 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 it's ensuring that I am equipping myself. So then when I'm in rooms where, where someone like a Jeff Rich is in, in the room, he will never have to question my ability because he sees Harvard there. He sees the World Economic Forum because those are things, whether I like it or not, that matter to them, right? And so you, we also have to play to that. We've also understand that this, and it's unfortunate, but it is the reality of it, right? Is in order for you to get into some of these rooms, you've got to get the credentials that are necessary for you to be in those rooms. Um, because when, you're, when, when we're dealing with significant uh, monies, right? You, I mean, you, you can't, we cannot half step. Like, I, I'm not going to trade on looks. As beautiful as I think I am, I cannot trade on looks. I've got to trade on something that is more lasting. I have a, a, a niece, Mackenzie. Um, she's, I think Mackenzie's six, she's in Canada. She wants to be a doctor. So what is Auntie Farai doing? Auntie Farai is preparing her um, so then she ends up at Harvard because she wants to go to Harvard. She's been on Harvard campus. She's walked on Harvard campus. She's met some of the professors. So I'm starting with her earlier on. One of the things that Jeff Rich said in his brief um, uh, presentation to us, he said he knew early on. That is so significant. When you read the book um, by... Um, by um, Malcolm Gladwell, um, uh, Outliers. It's a powerful book. I really encourage you guys to read any of Ma Malcolm Gladwell's books. But Outliers talks exactly to what uh, Jeff just said, that a, a 10,000 hour thing is very, very significant. But it starts with you, um, I tend you with your daughters. It starts at a very young age. You know, and that's unfor the unfortunate thing that we African have is that we start off much later on in life. We've got to start off early. In order for us to really catch up, you've got to start off, you've got to start off early. So uh, I'm only saying to say that um, I, I, I do, I'm very, very hard on myself. And, and I think that as I, as, I, as, I, as I get older, I realize that um, I've got to always bring in my best. Uh, I've got to always uh, bring in my best at whatever level, because I don't know who's watching. And, and for the fact that your girls are watching really means a lot to me. So thank you so much for that question. And hopefully I answered okay. it. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for our, and we're running mm -hmm. out of time. I'm yeah. just gonna read a few comments and, <clears throat> and then we're gonna wrap up. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I'm sure <clears throat> your question has been answered. Most of you, I see your questions. They've been answered through what Farai has, has been saying, you know? And, uh, you know, so yeah, so there's a, thank you, uh, Farai. Thank you, Dr. Mandaza. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to have this inspirational discussion. Uh, and then that's from, that was from uh, Cathbert. Blessed evening, humble apologies. I connected late, okay, we forgive you. <laughs> thank you, Doc, for bringing Farai. This is deep insight indeed, Farai, thanks for sharing. That's Apostle A. Uh, Babusi, thank you for creating this platform. Farai is such an inspiration. I'm a young bl black woman looking up to her. Richard, thanks for this great presentation, quite helpful, informative encouraging business people think now and beyond so a lot of people are just thankful for i there's so many comments we need to have you back here because we haven't even touched a whole lot and and you know we really need you to to speak uh, uh you know a lot of the things that you're saying a whole lot more to our to our young entrepreneurs so i just want to encourage you next time invite other people can you imagine the people who are supposed to hear this that didn't hear it tonight but fortunately, it's going to be there, I think, for maybe 24 hours on Facebook. So you can tell your, your friends to go check it out and, and hear uh, and learn, get them to learn some of the things that Farai has been talking about. You know, also, please subscribe to our Instagram and Facebook pages as well. And, um, you know, and then next week, next week, oh, my God, 
Next week, we've got one of the richest guys out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. You know, he's the former CEO of the Diamond Board. Um, I mean, he's got so many things. I mean, he owns a gold mine that's worth about three, four billion dollars. He, I mean, his his resume is is like Farais, okay, and Jeffs, okay. So he's at that level. So you don't want to miss the the um, the poster will be out tomorrow. So we're gonna have the honor of having him him on board and um, you know just sharing wisdom so please invite other people and also my book my book is done okay so that's gonna be out soon okay so uh they, we're just doing final uh, final uh editing on it that's and jeff is uh, helping me as through his wife jeff's wife is one of the number one book publishers in the world uh Yay. pre millers they're they're leading on the New York uh, book uh, list and all of that, she's she's right up there. So, all right. So, okay. Next week, I, I, I may I may I may have a book. I've been Spoo has been forced has been challenging me to write a book. So I may have a book um, for 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 his wife. Yeah, that I'm you, you want to talk to Jen? Jen yeah. uh, does books for all, all the top people: T.D. Jakes, Joel Austin. Uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump, uh, B.B. No, Winans. No, 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 not Donald Trump. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, not, not Donald. Okay, sorry. I scratch. <laughs> Please scratch that one out. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, we pray, we'll talk we for, pray for you guys. Yeah, we, we pray for you guys uh, during this time in America. And we know it's not not been easy, and uh, you know with what's happened with George Floyd and so on. And we just hope you guys keep safe. And you know, I know you guys are speaking out on it, and I've seen it on your page, Jeff and Farai. You know, Farai gets emotional. She actually, oh, yeah. uh, you know, gets very emotional about it. So you know, we're praying for you, and we're hoping for a better world tomorrow. So you know, thank you guys. Yeah. yeah. But no, thanks, I, 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 I wore eyelashes because I knew I was. I, I didn't want to cry. So anytime I wear eyelashes, I'm like, yeah, it forces me not to cry. Um, but really, thank you so much for your well wishes. I, I think America is 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 right on target with with what's happening. I, I appreciate the thoughts and continue to pray for America um, because she is a world leader. Um, and what I love about America is that, um, in as much as people give us a hard time, um, the Americans mean well. The Americans um, they are courageous enough to um, go through what we're going through on the world stage um, in order to show your the dark side of your the dark side of your your own country and to do it as publicly as america is doing i i truly and living amongst them and seeing them the ugly and the good i mean the media may show you the ugly there's equally um goodness that the people here have and so continue to pray for this nation god is using her very very powerfully um and even pray for the president in as much as we may not understand how he moves and how he does things do also pray for him because after all he does occupy the office of the president and it's the office of the president that we have respect for because people did vote for him so also pray for him even even as he does what he does and we may not understand it but do pray for the for the country right i don't know Thank if you feel you. the same way jeff but th those are my views yeah jeff your parting shots uh change is always overdue and it's necessary and it is happening uh it won't come without a price but it's a price we're all willing to pay at least yeah. most of my friends are willing to pay so uh it's it's been too long coming and I know Walter, you've you've lived this in South Africa. I know. Uh, your struggle started way after ours did. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. watch what we're doing. Yeah. Live and learn. Yeah. Bring, help bring about change in a productive, constructive way. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes uh, you have to do things to get people's attention, and that's yeah. what's happening in America yeah. right now. We're getting, yeah. we're getting people's attention. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now now you're gonna you're gonna make me cry, uh, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but uh, thank you so much, you know, and, and it's so inspiring. You know, you, you guys are, are both great individuals. Uh, you know, you are great personalities at the heart. And I think that's something that I think our entrepreneurs need to realize that it's not just about climbing the ladder and stepping on whoever you can step on because you've got a great idea. You've also got to be human. You know, you, 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 your purpose is so important. I think we spoke about it on the session with Vusi and, and John, that, that purpose is at the heart of whatever you want to do. Are you doing it out of selfish uh, motive or are you doing it to be a blessing to somebody and to help someone else? And usually those guys that are doing it to be a blessing and help someone else, they're the guys that come out on top because motive will always take the lead at the end of the day. All right. That's very Everybody, well said. You will never yeah. regret serving others. Yeah. Right. It's true. <laughs> and the Bible does say, give and it shall be given back unto you, isn't it? So yeah. every action that you do uh, and you give out, God is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, give you back, you know. And, uh, and that's just how it works, you know. So, so I think uh, we, a lot of our participants are Christians and they understand these things, you know. And, um, you know, just to share with you, you know, just before we go, something that happened with me just about a, a, a week or two weeks ago, you know, uh, and I was just saying to God, I was saying to God, how can I serve you? You know, what can I do? You know, what is it that you want me to do? How can I serve you? Because that's my heart. You know, I was like, can I bring you a glass of water? I mean, what, what can I do? And then he spoke to my heart and he said, Walter, I'm your partner. And when he said that, I could, I could hear and I could understand more than just the words. I could understand the fact that he's in me and I'm in him. And whatever I'm doing, he's actually doing it with me. You know, when I, when I touch something, when I go into a deal, he's touching it with me. When I'm signing it, he's signing it with me. And so that's so profound, especially for the Christian uh, businessman to understand that God wants to be your partner. You know, I was, meanwhile, I'm thinking, okay, what can I do for him? You know, he's a great God. He's an awesome God. You know, I'm trying to avail myself to be a blessing to him. But he's like, no, it's, it's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm your partner. So he's your partner. All right. And he wants you to know that that idea that you have, he's probably put it in your mind and that he's going to work with you and through you to make it come to pass. As long as your motive is right and your heart is in the right place and you understand the purpose of business and the purpose of your money, you will see miraculous things happening. And oftentimes people struggle because they have not understood the purpose for their business. You know, they think it's just to buy jets and stuff like that. No, money is not always just to buy jets. Yes, you can buy jets, but they, there's a likelihood, uh, probably 99%, that your money is meant to help someone else. And when your money begins to do that, that's when your life takes a new meaning. And you will see things happening that you never dreamt would happen. So that's my, those are my last words. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody, until next week, remember, Victor Kasongo is joining us next week. And the poster will be out tomorrow, so please. Let's all be back and let's invite someone else. Okay. Thank you so God much. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 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 Sunday for yet another exciting session with a world changer. These programs are designed to bring the best in the world to empower you for your success. People that have made a difference in the area of sports, entertainment, politics, social media, in the area of just general knowledge, you know, through the experience. So I don't want you to miss it because we've assembled the best of the best. For the first time, you can interact with them and ask them questions. Find out 
how they made it, be in the same Zoom chat with them and get to have a one-on-one -on -one experience. People that you may have seen on TV and thought you'll never be able to ask them a question directly. Well, this is your chance. Join us this Sunday at 6 p.m. on Zoom.